The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. The Gospel of the Lord. So as I was coming in this morning, uh, a few people commented to me about my pink shirt uh, because it stands out in the otherwise solemn season of Advent. Um, I'm not wearing this because I'm one of those men who feel like I can confidently pull off pink. Um, it's actually, my, my wife bought me this shirt specifically to wear on the third Sunday of Advent. And for the, those of you who light Advent candles at home might know that the, the th- today, the third Sunday of Advent, is the day that we light the pink candle, which it turns out is the liturgical color of joy. And many churches observe the third Sunday of Advent as Gaudete Sunday, which means Rejoice Sunday. And for a long time, I thought the pink candle, even after I was like going to a liturgical church, I thought the pink candle was for love, right? Because it makes sense like pink or maybe rose and love. And, and then also I knew well enough to know that Advent was a time of solemnity and contemplation. And, and joy was a word that I associated with Christmas, with, you know, kids tearing open presents to see if they got that to- jo- toy or gadget that they were hoping for. I, I recently saw a, a viral video that was released last year of a bunch of school kids who had been given gifts by like a generous local company who wanted to buy ki- gifts for school kids. And there's this one kid who opens up a Roblox gift card and he's literally squealing and jumping up and down with joy. And then he looks over at his friend who's opening up his gift and his face just drops as he sees his buddy opening up a brand new PlayStation 5 worth $500. And the the kid literally like falls over. (laughs) Theodore Roosevelt purportedly said, comparison is the thief of joy. But I I called this boy's initial experience joy because that's the word that we use for that kind of unbridled emotion. That's what we call the emotional high we have when we finally receive something we've been longing for or achieve something that felt impossible. We might think of it as being like happiness, but more intense and maybe more fleeting. But that can't be the whole story. Because all over the Bible, there are passages that call us to things like, did you notice, if you did it, in in the first Thessalonians passage we read today, it said, rejoice always. Paul says the same thing in in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Is that how joy works? I don't know about you, but I can't maintain that kind of emotional energy to rejoice always. That's how we think about joy. And I think in response to the Bible's many exhortations to joy and rejoicing, and there are many, actually every passage we read today says something about joy. Some Christians have made the misguided attempt to look happy all the time and pretend that everything is perfect. That's how we try to live out these exhortations. And some of us actually struggle with the holidays for this very reason, because we don't want to have to plaster holiday joy on our face and pretend that everything is okay when the reality of life is much more complicated. If that's you this morning and you're like, oh, it's Rejoice Sunday, have good news. That's not what Christian joy is. Christian joy is more than putting on a nice face on everything. And it's more than a fleeting moment of happiness that comes and goes with our circumstances. The Bible never gives us a textbook definition of Christian joy. 
probably because it's more caught than taught. But if I had to give a definition for our purposes today, it would be this. Joy is the soul's glad response to the goodness of God. It's the soul's glad response to the goodness of God. And while the Bible doesn't give us a definition, it does provide some compelling images of what joy looks like in the lived lives of Jesus' followers. And I want to look at the gospel reading today in John chapter 3, which shows us an episode in the life of an unlikely ambassador of joy. John the Baptist is a prophet. We talk about him a lot in the season of Advent, and he's actually Jesus' cousin, though they didn't grow up seeing each other. And in the gospel, he comes across as being rough around the, the edges, uh, a little bit severe. He lives out in the wilderness. He eats bugs. He goes around telling people to repent of their sins. Eventually, he tells the king to repent of his sins, and King Herod doesn't like that very much, and it ends up with him being imprisoned and ultimately executed. When I think of John the Baptist, I think of hope. I think of sacrifice. I think of conviction. Joy is not the word that comes to mind. But maybe it should be. A couple of chapters before the passage that we read today, John is baptizing people in Bethany on the east bank of the Jordan River, modern-day Jordan, when Jesus comes forward. And when John sees Jesus... The Holy Spirit helps him recognize who he is. And, and he tells the people, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He actually calls Jesus the Son of God in front of all these people. Now, John's endorsement is a big deal. Because at this point, nobody knew Jesus. But John had gotten pretty famous. Large crowds are following him. And even some of the religious leaders from Jerusalem had started sending people to check out what this guy was doing and, and what is this baptism thing and what's he talking about? And I can almost see John's disciples like being excited that they were part of this ministry. They were the close friends and followers of this rising star. Then we fast forward a bit. Jesus does a bunch of miracles in Jerusalem and then he begins drawing his own crowds and people start coming to him. And that's where this passage begins that we read today in verse 22. I'm going to read it in the first part again. John chapter 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Now we don't know who this Jewish person was. Um, that John's disciples are having a discussion with, but they're probably talking about baptism. And it, it, usually when John talks about the Jews generically like that, he's actually referring specifically to Jewish leaders at the time. And so it's possible that this was somebody sent from the Jewish leaders discussing the legitimacy of what John was doing. And John had come under a little bit of fire for his practice of baptism from some of the Jewish leaders earlier on. And in chapter one, they send some people to talk to John and they say, if you're not Elijah and you're not the Messiah, then what business do you have baptizing? So probably I, I would think that John's disciples might have been a bit defensive regarding their rabbi's credibility. And their rabbi's credibility mattered to them because they're his disciples. They're going to be the ones who continue his ministry. So his credibility is their credibility. His success is their success. And possibly over the course of this conversation about purification, they find out that this upstart Jesus had set up camp not that far away from John. And his disciples had started baptizing people just like John had, except they were drawing even larger crowds than John. You can almost hear the indignation. Look at verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. So if you had a lemonade stand as a kid, and your cousin came over and asked you for some lemons, and then he went across the street and opened his own lemonade stand and charged five cents less, right? You can just see this indignation. I, I can imagine the conversation they had with John. Who does this Jesus think he is? You're the Baptist. Baptizing is your thing, John. How dare he encroach on your ministry? Maybe they expected John to be indignant. 
or to come in and show Jesus how it's done. I've been baptizing longer than Jesus. But instead of indignation, instead of insecurity, John's response to Jesus is joy. Listen to what he says and listen for that theme of joy. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. There's a lot packed in here. But I think this is helpful for us. And I want to pick out four characteristics of Christian joy that can help us learn how to live out joy in our own lives. First, Christian joy receives everything as a gift. John says, no one can receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. John recognized that any ministry he had, any platform he had, any impact that he had was given to him freely by God. And this is important because by receiving everything as a gift, it freed him from any sense of entitlement or the need for comparison. Let's go back to that video I talked about in the introduction. When the kid had his gift card, when was he happy? When he was focused on the fact that he had just received this generous gift that he had done nothing to earn. And when did his joy fade? So when he began to wonder why his friend got a more expensive gift. Nothing changed in his circumstances. He had the same gift card. He just lost sight of the fact that he had been given a gift. John was able to maintain his perspective that God had used him to prepare people for the work that God wanted to do in their life. God didn't have to choose him for that role. But the fact that he did was amazing. It was a gift. And there's an important lesson here for us. It's so easy for us to look at the gifts that others have been given and compare our gifts with their gifts, our ministry with their ministry, our family with their family. We give in to that oof of joy comparison. Our canon theologian, Stephen Godier, who some of you know, likes to point out that when we compare ourselves with others, we become both jealous and proud. If I think I'm better than someone, I become proud of my own gift. And if I think someone's better than me, I become jealous of the gifts that they have. Comparison is the thief of joy. But what's the opposite? What actually invites us into joy? Gratitude. If we want more joy in our Christian life, a good place to start is by fostering habits of gratitude. Maybe you can't choose to feel joy. I, I can't choose to feel joy. But I can choose to give thanks. And in time, I think we'll find that gratitude slowly gives way to genuine joy. So the Christian, Christian joy receives everything as a gift. But the second characteristic that we see here is just as important. We need to keep this in mind. Christian joy delights in Jesus more than in his gifts. Christian joy delights in Jesus more than in his gifts. John gives us the image of a wedding. And perhaps you've been to a wedding with that one wedding guest who forgets the day is not all about them. It's especially bad when it's the groom's buddy who takes the title best man a little too much to heart because he gets a microphone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Travis, and I've been Kyle's best friend since middle school. And now if we're lucky, hopefully Travis will tell one or two funny stories about Kyle, and then he'll tell the bride how wonderful they are together. And, and that's the script. If, if he follows the script, it's going to be okay. But sometimes Travis, bless his heart, forgets that this moment, if your name is Travis, I'm sorry, I had to choose a name, that this moment is not about him. And he decides this is the moment for him to try his hand at stand-up comedy. Or this is the moment where he's going to tell all these stories that mostly demonstrate how important he is to the groom. And it's awkward. Because everybody there isn't there for Travis. They're there because they love the bride and the groom. They're not there for the party. They're not there for the gifts that come with the wedding. Ideally, 
They're there for love of the bride and groom, and they want to share in their joy. John doesn't want to be that friend. He had a special calling to be something like the best man of the Messiah, as the Messiah comes for his bride, the church. The groom and bride imagery is actually found in the Old Testament to describe the relationship of God with his people. And John is standing witness to God's wedding vows, God's promises to his people. And if you're truly the groom's friend, you're not jealous when people start paying attention to the groom. You're not there for attention. You're not there for a party. You're there for the groom. And when the groom shows up, you rejoice Right Now, John had a unique calling as a witness of the Messiah. But all of us who are Christians share somewhat in that calling as witnesses of the promises of God. And there are certainly gifts and benefits that come with that witness, right? Christian community is a blessing. God's provision is a blessing. Inner peace is a blessing. But we have to be careful about getting too attached to the gifts. Because Jesus wants a relationship with you. Which means he wants you to love him for who he is and not for his stuff. The time may come where something will happen to the stuff. And you're going to have a decision to make. Do I follow Jesus and trust him and love him because of what it gets me? Because of how it makes me feel? Or do I really delight in the voice of the breath? Sometimes it's hard to delight in the voice. And I think we might think it was easier. Because John got to see him face to face. Yeah, I know, I know Jesus is always with us through the Holy Spirit and and all that, but maybe I'd have an easier time rejoicing with Jesus if I could actually see him and talk to him. That brings us to the third characteristic, Christian joy. And that's this. Christian joy flows out Christian hope. The virtue of hope in the Bible is different than the way we often use the word. Uh, We usually use the word to describe something that we want to happen, but that isn't certain, right? I hope the Bears win today. Who knows? Or maybe we'll talk about it as a vague belief that things will get better. The Bears lost, but I still have hope, right? It's aspirational. That's not what the Bible means by the word. The virtue of Christian hope is expectation or even anticipation that God's promises will come to pass. Almost 10 years ago, I asked my then girlfriend, Kristen, to marry me. And when she said yes, I was overjoyed. Had she married me yet? No, it's not that we'd gotten married, but because I had every reason to believe that she would marry me. When we have the virtue of Christian hope, it means that we can actually begin to rejoice now in the promises of God, even when we haven't quite seen how he is going to fulfill them. This is what Jesus said about Abraham. Abraham died millennia ahead of Jesus. And he said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Throughout the history of God's people, there were men and women who rejoiced in God's promises, not because they saw them fulfilled, but because they knew that God keeps his promises, which is how the book of Romans can invite us to rejoice in hope. So back to John the Baptist. In verse 29, John says that with the start of Jesus' ministry, his joy is complete. I titled the sermon Full Joy. A complete can be translated full because I was reflecting on this and I, I wish I could go back and change the title uh, because that's not actually where we live all the time. That's not where John got his start. That's not where he, his joy first began. His joy in the promises of God began before he ever saw Jesus. It began before he was ever born. Do you remember? John's first encounter with Jesus. Right after Jesus' mother, Mary, finds out that she's expecting, she goes to her relative Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. And when she walks in and greets Elizabeth, here's what Elizabeth says. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. John had not yet seen Jesus. His baby mind didn't even understand anything about what was going to happen. 
but his soul began to participate in the joy of what was to come. You and I have received the first part of God's promise. He sent us his Savior. He sent us his Holy Spirit. And that is certainly cause for joy. It's the first part of our joy. But he's also made us a promise that Jesus is coming back for us. And he will be our forever king. And he will trample evil and reign with justice. We're still waiting for that. We're not there yet. But the promise is cause for joy. Right now, you might say that our joy is a partial joy. C.S. Lewis famously observed that the way he experienced joy, especially as he was first coming into faith, was as this sweet, almost painful longing for something beautiful. Our joy is like the joy of a couple who is engaged and waiting with expectation for their wedding day. It's the weary traveler who just sat down on the plane on that long voyage home. Sometimes our joy is in a minor, tinged with longing. But Christian hope assures us that someday our joy, like John's, will be full, complete, and all the more sweet because of the time we've spent waiting. And this brings us to the final characteristic Christian joy in this passage. Christian joy is able to set aside lesser joy. Christian joy can set aside lesser joys. In high school, I was on the wrestling team, which meant that I had to cut weight if I wanted to be at the top of my weight class. I'm not proud of the way that I did that. It was not the most healthy uh, approach to living. But I really enjoyed wrestling, and I wanted to win. And there were days leading up to a meet where I was faced with a decision between the joy of being able to wrestle in the meet in the appropriate weight class and the joy of a large, decadent brownie. I really wanted it. Both would have given me some joy, but I wanted this more. This was a more complete joy in a way. It was more satisfying. It was something that I wanted more. And so most of the time, I was able to choose to wrestle over choosing the brownie. This is what John is talking about in verse 30 when he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Not weight loss. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is giving up a lesser joy for something greater. What John wanted most, the thing that had defined his life and ministry from the time he was eight, was preparing the way for the Lord. And now that the Lord was here, his job was to see that as many people as possible receive Jesus as king. Was it nice to have people following him and listening from him and benefiting from his ministry? Sure. I'm sure that was great. I'm sure it made him feel like he was really serving the Lord and doing something important. But what he really wanted was for people to meet his Savior. And so his Christian joy, delight in Jesus, won out over his desire for success. He must increase and I must decrease. Sometimes the lesser joy that we're called to give up is actually a good thing. It's just not the ultimate thing. Historically, the season of Advent is a time when Christians engage in the spiritual disciplines of fasting, generosity, and prayer. It's like Christmas's Lent counterpart. Lent is to Easter as Advent is to Christmas. And when we engage in these practices, when we give up the good gift of food to fast for a day or for a season, the good gift of financial resources for those who need it, the good gift of productive time that we can spend doing something else that we spend in prayer, we allow ourselves to decrease in these areas so that Jesus and his kingdom might increase in us. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus did the same thing for you and for me. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus, because of the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy of having us in his family. The joy, pleasure of his father enabled him to make the ultimate sacrifice to save us from our sins that we too might increase in him. Christian joy isn't just something that Jesus demands of us from a distance. Jesus himself 
practice this kind of joy. And he invites us to share it. This is where the rubber hits the road for us. As I was preparing the sermon, I was originally going to talk about John's humility and like setting aside our ego. And I realized I actually need this ministry of joy. Th- this is what I need from the Lord, right? And because joy isn't just a perk of the Christian life. If you're a Christian, then you feel happy. But that's, that's not how it works. We actually need joy for our Christian life. The joy of the Lord is what strengthens us. Joy is what will sustain us when our resources and our influence and our provision decreases. We can't manufacture it. We can't make it happen. I'm not asking you to plaster a smile on your face. But we can open ourselves up. And we can ask for it. And we can even cultivate it. Make room for it. We cultivate it through gratitude. Creating habits of thanking God for the gifts that he's given us. We cultivate it through our relationship with Jesus as we delight in him and make space for prayer and listening to his voice in scripture. We cultivate it as we reflect on the certain promises. And we cultivate it when we set aside the lesser joy for the greater ones. How is God calling you to enter into joy this Advent season? Maybe he's calling you into an intentional practice of gratitude, journaling, five minutes in the morning, thinking about the blessings of the Lord and thanking him for them. Maybe he's calling you into a deeper communion with Jesus in scripture. Maybe he's calling you into generosity. There's somebody in your life who has some tangible needs and, and he wants to create space in you for his joy by emptying you a little bit of your financial resources for the sake of those who need, of, of those who need it. My prayer for you is that during this week leading up for Christmas, that Jesus will launch you into a joy that is deeper and fuller and richer than happy songs and eggnog and jolly merriment. I want to pray with you for that right now. Father, we need your joy. There is so much that we carry with us that draws our hearts down into despair. There are so many things that are not the way that they should be, but our hearts are grieved. Lord, we need a ministry of your joy this morning. I pray for this family. Pray for the people of the man. Lord, I pray that you would do a ministry of joy among them. Lord, if there's anyone here who is bound down by comparison. Pray for a release of the gift of gratitude. Pray that even now that they would feel your gratitude for your gifts welling up. If there's anyone who who has just found that their joy in Jesus is diminished, Lord, I pray for a personal connection. I pray even during the time of communion that they would hear the voice of the bridegroom, that you would give them the gift of rejoicing. Lord, call us deeper into the life of your church. Call us deeper in fasting. Call us deeper in generosity. Prayer. We ask that when Christmas comes, that we would be ready to receive our King. Lord, we pray that when he comes again, when we hear that trumpet, that we would be ready to welcome joy, full joy. We ask this, his holy name. Amen.